And we are live. Happy Monday. Um, we are so excited to see you um, today. Our, my name is Maggie. Um, today we are here. Purse Strings is here going live with um, Rob Riedel on this side. It's opposite. Um, just so everyone knows, um, Purse, Strings here, Purse Strings is here every week. We're all about providing uh, free financial education just so you can, you know, get some tidbits of of information and be on your way and feel financially fearless. But when you need a professional to put things in transition or transaction, we have a list of top tier vetted professionals who are willing and ready and able to serve you. Um, we call those our purse strings approved professionals and Rob Riedel is one of them. Um, so Rob, we are so excited to have you here today. Well, appreciate it. Nice, nice to be here with everyone. Thank you. Um, and so today we're gonna be talking about really, you know, why getting this health plan is so in, or, um, or your wealth plan, not your health plan, your wealth plan is so important. And um, it really allows you to like enjoy and relax and, you know, just live your life. Um, and I know that's a big thing you're passionate about, Rob. And so first, can we just get a little intro about you and who you are? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm Rob Riedel. I'm president of Endowment Wealth Management and we're SEC registered investment advisor that serves as or for our clients throughout the United States as a fee only fiduciary advisor. And so I've got about 40 years of financial accounting experience that we bring to the table. But the purpose of what our clients really hire us for is really to protect their greatest asset, which is their family and, and, and to help them navigate the challenges of today. And so that's the world I live in on a daily basis. And I love that it's not just making wealth, but protecting family, because that's really, you're right, that's absolutely the bigger picture. Um, and so even, you know, before we started this, uh, I looked at your LinkedIn pro profile and it just says, you know, you believe that people truly deserve to relax and enjoy their life. What made you want to get into financial services or really have this passion behind the work that you do? Well, I think I think that you know the, the tagline that you keep re that you referred to is really something I say to our clients all the time. You've got to relax, you've got to enjoy your life, and you have to live your adventure. Because if you don't do that, you, you're kind of wasting your time. And I think that the reason I did it is because you could see people needed help. I used to be an Arthur Anderson CPA, and then I realized there was there was problems in personal wealth as they generate in the tax law changes and and everything that impacts their life. And then obviously the financial markets and the global world economy makes it more and more complex and, and tens of thousands of investment vehicles out there. And so what, you know, when I really bore down into it is I really realized that most people don't live to work, they work to live. And then when they do do it, they, they really want to figure out what to do with their life. And that's where the disconnect comes because they have connectivity to work that they can't get away from it today in COVID, emails, cell phones, texts. You just can't you can't break it apart. So the easiest thing is to focus on work and kind of forget your personal life. And and that's where I think where the where the need and the pressure comes into the average investor and the average person out there. I definitely agree there that uh, that division is coming very hard now, and just work is kind of taking over the life, especially if you're working from home sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know we do have to relax. And a lot of people think, or you know, I've talked to a lot of people. And talking about their money makes them anxious, you know, and so it's just kind of interesting the way, um, you know, you want them to relax, but first we do have to get through this money conversation, which is so important. Um, and you always recommend starting with a wealth plan. Can you kind of explain to our audience what that is? Well, I, well, I think the thing that, that makes it most important, and I think, you know, go back to the point you made why people don't necessarily start or initiate a, uh, the, the finances because they don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. They don't know who to trust, so they don't do anything. And so really what you want to do is you want to get direction, you want to get tax efficiency, risk efficiency, your time efficiency, and organize it into a plan that gives you kind of, I'm going to sound old here, but that, like a AAA trip tech for a vacation to say, where are you trying to go? And what are you trying to do? And what's the time frames that you're trying to get it done in? And then do it. And I think the complexity of like just the tax laws, it makes everybody, you know, I'm sure there's people watching this today that haven't filed their taxes and are, haven't even started them because they're afraid. And that's what's mm -hmm. wrong about it. And so, so I don't know, I, I don't know, Maggie, do we have participations that can answer? I mean, when we, if we ask them a question, do we have the ability to hear an answer? Um, yes, some people can respond. It's a couple seconds delayed, um, but we can we could prompt a question. Well, 
and I don't know if we can do a survey, but does anybody out there know their marginal federal tax rate? I don't yeah. even know mine. See, I mean, I, you know, that's an important thing. I mean, I don't know if I've, I've got some crazy door prizes here if somebody answers that, but I don't need to know your tax rate, but do you, do you know what it is? Because that's what Uncle Sam's going to take for every dollar you make, or that's what you're going to save for every dollar you put in your retirement account. So if your marginal tax rate is, say, 24%, every dollar that you take home, Uncle Sam takes 24 cents. For every dollar you put in your retirement account, Uncle Sam gives you 24 cents of that. And so if you understand some of the tax laws, it makes your planning more beneficial. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure many people on here have not done their taxes yet. Um, because, yeah, marginal tax rate. I'm I'm waiting to see if anyone replies and does know that because um, I don't even I don't know mine. I already did my taxes, but I don't know mine. Um, so yeah, it's interesting that we just need to jump in and be part of this conversation. Um, you look like you're ready to say something. Yeah, and I, I guess the, the thing is, I don't know how. Yeah, you know, here I'm going to encourage everybody. Here, here's door prize number one. Oh, when in doubt, coffee. Yeah. So a twenty-five dollar gift certificate. Mine is to try to say, know that. If you don't know it, then know it going forward. I, I'll let Maggie try to figure out who, who's going to be the winner of that one. But, but it's really, it's really important to know that, and then to know some of the other retirement laws and some of the, the strategies to how to save money. Because the best way to get a raise is to stop paying Uncle Sam, and, and you, you have control of that. Definitely, definitely. And that's through some of the services I know that like you, you can provide and really having this whole wealth um, kind of physical going through every different portion of the money that you have um, to really see then the big picture of what you have going on and your, and your timeline. C correct. And I mean, the, the importance of a financial plan is really that you get organized, that you, that you, you know where everything is, is almost as if you're going to die tomorrow, that you, there wouldn't be a treasure hunt. Because with that, all your all your personal data, all the facts, all your goals, all your time frames, and then out of that, you kind of create a, a wealth strategy that says, what's your what's your risk profile? When the stock market's going up, everybody's an investor. Stock market's going down, nobody wants to be an investor because they didn't understand the risk of the market, or they left too many chips on the table. They don't have a tax strategy. They don't have a tax plan. They don't have an estate plan. I mean, do you know who your beneficiaries are? Do you know if you want to leave the charity? Do you have, do you have protection of, of life insurance, long-term care, identity protection, liability? Mm -hmm. All those things come into a wealth plan. And if you don't weave them together, you you don't really have a plan. You have a partial plan. And it's, it's, it's getting that holistic approach that really brings it together that's critical to it because you want to protect that your hard-earned money and your family and your assets and you want to transfer it risk efficiently and, 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 and estate efficiently to your heirs. And I think that's a that's a great point of it's not just about earning more money and more money. It's like, what do you want to do with that? Do you want to right. help generations to come? Are you, you know, do you really believe in, you know, wanting to solve hunger, whatever the whatever the thing is, it's really putting money towards these things and being more actionable than just like earning lots of money and becoming just wealthy out of the point of wealth. Well, well absolutely. And I think one of the things I, yeah, I always see a commercial or, or a newspaper ad or somebody says, how much money do I need to retire? It, it really is how much money do you need to, to live off of in retirement? How much do you need in income? So if I need $50,000, you should have a million dollars. Cause we think if you use a 5% rule for every million dollars, you can safely take out 5% over your longevity and sustain your wealth. So to, to, if you need 50,000, you have to get to a million. If you don't need 50,000, you need 25, you need 500,000. And the reason you can get it there, go back to what I said before in your marginal tax rate while you're working is 24%. And maybe when you're retired, it's 12%. So if you, mm. you save 24% putting it in, and then you only pay 12% coming out, you've made you made 12% plus you've had the time value of tax deferral on the investment. So it's those strategies that help you achieve your retirement, the more you understand those strategies. And yeah, I think a lot of people kind of sometimes think that they just have to earn the million dollars, you know, just by going to work every day, which is not how it works. You gotta, you have to do something with it to make it work itself, make the money work for you as well. 
Yeah. Well, absolutely. And that's where you want to diversify. And then, you know, that's where you use your 401k or 403b or your IRA or your Roth IRA, different investment instruments that, that help you save. And I mean, for people who haven't filed their taxes, you know, as a general rule, you could, if you're not covered by a 401k or 403b, you could still fund an IRA for last year mm -hmm. up to April, April 18th of this year. So, you know, if you've got, if you're under 56,000, over 57,000, put it in because you'll save whatever your marginal tax rate is. So if I'm in a 24% bracket, I put 6,000 away. I'm saving about 1,400 and some odd dollars. Uncle, Sam, Uncle Sam's giving it to you and you're putting 4,500 in. So, I mean, the game's not over till you file your taxes, but there's a lot of planning that goes in to help you align what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, and it's it's important to really know all these strategies, and that's why you have a professional to help you out, because um, no one's expecting you to come to the table and know all of this. But that's why, like, what's the process kind of to get started with you and to kind of get this process going? Well, I think with us, it's really to fill out the data sheet, and I think I forwarded one over to you, man, to, to to fill out a data sheet and then to get organized. Number one step is get organized, get organized, get organized, because until you can get organized and align your goals with your assets and really put the time frames and the risk strategies onto each one of those goals, it, it makes for a difference in, in your plan. But I think, you know, again, as you go forward, there's so many financial advisors out there, people. I mean, it's just, they, they may not be a fee-only fiduciary, but they might be a, a stockbroker or an insurance agent. And really the number one thing I, I would say as you proceed, get organized. And then number two, if you can't, if you need help, which I think everyone does, Find a CFP or a fee-only fiduciary to help you and, and then listen to their guidance and, and avoid people who are pushing annuities or financial products or even mutual funds that sometimes are just, they're, they're too costly and they're tax inefficient for what you're possibly trying to do. So I would, you know, take that step or get organized and, and then search out either local help or national help, whatever you feel comfortable with that can assist you to achieve your goals. Um, and can you just remind our audience what fee-only fiduciary really means? Yeah, I mean, if you looked at the financial services world, there used to be people called stockbrokers years and years ago. And now nobody calls themselves a stockbroker. They're, they're a consultant, a wealth advisor, whatever it is. But they work for a brokerage firm like RBC or Edward Jones or LPL. And they're the majority of the industry or their life insurance salesman that's calling themselves something else. And they're really leading with a product. And really, there's a very small island called fee only, and sometimes it's fee based, where where that that's all they do. They get we get paid by one person, our client. We don't get any trips. We don't sell mutual funds and get a commission. None of that. We get paid in an advisory role from from our consult from our clients, and it's fully disclosed. And that's the difference. That there's some people that are trying to transition from commission based to fee based, and they're called hybrids or or, or semi fee. Mm -hmm. Avoid them because you don't know when they're fee and you don't know when they're not fee. I mean, it, it's kind of like either you know either you are or you aren't, and and then they they generally want to push a product of an annuity or, or a high commission based mutual fund, which isn't to your advantageous to you. So, uh, but I mean, you can go to like the CFP.net website or you can go to Napa N A P F A dot org and find fee only uh, fiduciaries. Anybody who's a CFP is a fiduciary, and that means mm -hmm. that for you and only you, they don't work for anybody else. Yeah, and that's really the most important part is that they are on your team and they have the best interest of you in mind on that fiduciary standpoint. Um, and so, yeah, it's important to know that they're not selling you a product, your best interest is in mind um, and you know exactly upfront what you're gonna be paying. It's not, there's not gonna be any surprises anywhere. Um, and yes, we'll post this data sheet um, in the comments and so people can get it there. And there are a lot of different things that you just need to get organized from the people who, you know, you want your money to be passed down to and where your documents are and, you know, what you're earning and who you want things to go to. I was just looking it over. And so it is very thorough, um, but it's so important. I mean, it's all the it's all the information that I don't think is written down anywhere else. You know, it's just all well, up I mean, here. Just, I mean, just the titling of an account. I mean, people get married and they keep it in their own name. And then if they were to die, their spouse would technically have to go through probate to get the, the cash that was in his wife's checking or savings accounts. I mean, you know, put it in joint account, get the titling right, get get the information right. Uh, 
and 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 then live your life. I mean, once you're organized, and that's the whole point of this is just to you know relax, live your life, and 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 chase your adventure. I mean, and it's just that's the key to it. And to do it with confidence is to know where your assets are, and mm-hmm. and to know what's going to happen if something happens. Fifty percent of our clients do not have an estate plan, do not have wills, do not have trusts. None, and and they're probably in their average of fifty to sixty years old. We have young younger clients who don't have estate plans, naming guardians for their children. I mean, wow, it's it's just crazy. And hopefully they never need it. But if they ever did, and they don't have it, you got a, a legal nightmare of two families saying, okay, who's going to raise the grandson, the granddaughter? So I mean, it's it's spending the money on yourself. I mean, it's it's really getting that estate plan done, getting the account title. And that's where this financial plan comes from. It really organizes you. We look for what you're missing and what you're mm-hmm. not doing. And that's what every everybody would do with CFP. And normally you can, you know, have a free introductory consultation with them. It's, you know, you can find the personality you want. If it, you want, you know, a certain sex or you want a certain age, there's so many out there that, that can fit your needs. And, and because of remote today and because of webcams like this, you can do it remotely too. Yeah, it's, it's, you, you know, we have all our people on purse strings, but we always say, you know, talk to a couple of people because you can then find the best fit for you, whether, you know, you might find that you both have this commonality that, you know, then really clicks and then they're really your person. Um, so it is important to interview a couple of people unless, you know, the first one goes right, feels right. Um, but then the, I can't believe how many people don't have these estate plans or these wills and trust in place. Um, Because we've had so many conversations on here about how important that is and how much money and time and stress it saves your family. Um, And, you know, I'm sure you can look at their finances and say you can afford it as well. (laughs) Well, that's what I mean. And again, it it depends on wealth and assets. But as you you start accumulating, say, millions of dollars, or if you have retirement accounts and so forth, and you want to protect your kids or family, you you should have a trust because it doesn't go through probate. It's private. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what you inherit. Versus a will go through probate, the attorney gets a commission in a sense or a fee for putting it through probate. So you lose two to three percent. And it just it doesn't make sense because you could have done it in your lifetime and mm-hmm. fulfilled your goals. And again, here we go again, goals based and and get what you want it done privately and, and do it in your lifetime and, and do it yourself and leave the risk to no one else. And so that's that really is important. And, and the same thing for beneficiary designations and mm-hmm. 401k asset allocations, all those things, you, people set it and forget it. And then they never look at it and they don't want to because they don't know what they don't know. And mm-hmm. so they don't want to feel bad again. So you have to take control of every aspect of your life if you really want to have the, the fullest life outcomes at the end. That's a great piece of life advice right there. Yeah. Um, and so, um, oh, there's a thought that just flew out of my head. Listen, um, what you think about that, here's my, here's tax question number two for everybody. Oh yeah, all right, let's hear yeah. it. Okay, how many ways does Medicare tax you when you when you work? And is it is it just one way, two ways? How many times can they access a tax on you for Medicare? All right, we're going to see what people have to say on this if one. If anybody answers, let me know. I'll give the answer once. once uh, but the question is, how often can you get taxed by Medicare in your working? Um, all right, somebody wrote in two. Nope. Um, we'll see. We'll see. Give it, we'll give another second or two and see what comes in. It's too low. Too low. All right. Um, and then we have a five. Too high. All right. Well, it leaves us two left. <laughs> exactly. Sue gets the first one, they win. All right. And we got a three. Too low. And there's someone coming in with a four. Okay. Make sure you send your email so we can send you the prize. Yeah, they get taxed four ways. And here's how they do it. On, on the first approximately $147,000 of your wages, you pay a, a 7.65% FICA tax. And FICA is the Federal Insurance Contribution Act. And in that, there's both Social Security and Medicare. 
-hmm. And Medicare makes up about 1.45% of that. So there's tax number one on you. Tax number two, the same tax applies to your employer. So there's, they, they get another matching 1.45. And then when you get through the salary cap, Social Security goes away, but Medicare continues to tax you. This is why I call it step number three, up to $250,000. And so you get, there's your, there's your third tax. And then on top of it, you then get a surcharge when you go over $250,000 and it goes up to 2.35%. So I kind of count those as two or three, you might, five might've been the answer, but I think it's four. And then the fourth way they can get a tax on you is on your investment income. If you have investment income greater than $250,000, they put a 3.8% investment tax on top of that that goes to Medicare. So you get taxed, your employer gets taxed, your wages in excess of 147,000 gets taxed, and then it gets increased over 250. And then again, they tax on your, on your net inf investment income. So there's really four taxes going to Medicare and people don't know it and they don't realize it. And it just, it, it just eats away at your earnings. And it just, it's just one more way of putting another hidden tax on you, the working individual. That's uh, wild. Can you prevent any of those taxes? No. Can you what? You can't prevent any of those four taxes. Well, they, I mean, once you get over your, your once you get over the, this, what is the social security limit that goes away, but on the rest, every time you get paid, you're getting a tax. But if you go mm -hmm. over 350, they put a 90, a 90 bips or nine tenths of 1% surcharge on top of the 145, because they consider you wealthy and they know that your social security went away. And, but none of those two go to the, go to the employer. Once you hit the max of the 250, the 90% surcharge that takes you up to 235 or 2.35, the employer doesn't pay. And wow. so it's just, it's just crazy. That's what I mean, they nickel and dime you. Mm -hmm. and you have to save more, manage more, understand your expenses where you can control it because they're doing stuff like this behind the scenes. So if you're a small business owner, you say, well, I never have $250,000 in gain, but I sell my business one day. They take 3.8% over that 250 on you. So mm. they're, they're still going to get it. It's just, when do they get it? Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and it makes sense why you need to work with somebody to try to get at some of these. Because sometimes I think, you know, we work, you know, 40 hours a week, every week. We just got to spend some time on the money that we're working so hard for. Um, right, exactly, exactly. And then you have to understand how you're going to possibly lose it in by taxes. And I think taxes, you know, you can always say the stock market, but if, but if you're in a 24% tax and everything else, you're losing it right off the top. So it's how do you strategize to, to maintain the wealth and grow the wealth that allows you to live a, live a more, more fulfilled retirement and a fulfilled life and, and achieve more of your goals and live more of your adventures. Definitely. I think we can really grab from today that, you know, it's all about making a goal, making a plan, and that way you can be on your on your path to just living your life because you know everything's kind of set in its ways and you're getting your maximum benefits around. Yeah. And then I think from, you know, from a tip like, you know, from just for doing your taxes for those, either you're going to itemize or you're not going to itemize. If you if you don't itemize, your taxes are easier. If you itemize, you got to be a little bit more organized. Because really you have salt limits, state and local income tax limits of $10,000. Then you can add your mortgage interest in your charity. But if you don't get up over the standard deduction of 12,550 bucks, you don't have to worry about itemizing then your standard deduction. And so it's it's doing those things to understand how it applies, how it flows through your tax return mm -hmm. to make filing your taxes easier. And, and I think one, one other tidbit, I guess I'd throw out there for people, you know, for Today and today's cybersecurity and the risk. Mm -hmm. There's three things that I would really think about doing to protect you from a, a risk or, or from an identity protection. And and one is go to the credit bureaus and print out your credit report so you can see if you have an old credit card from maybe when you were single or or, or an apartment store that went out of business and shut them down because I'm not going to break into your house and steal your wallet or your purse. I'm going to break into Penny's computer and steals your identity off their system. And then I'm going to use your identity. So you want to get off of all the credit bureaus or all the credit accounts you're not using. And if you can get a free credit report every year. The second thing I would do is if you're not, if you don't require credit, if you're not buying a mortgage or needing a mortgage or buying a car and needing a loan, freeze your credit. 
go to the credit bureaus, and there's three of them, Experian, uh, Transamer TransUnion, and Equifax, and, and have your credit frozen. So nobody can even identify. If I tried to open up a credit card even after I freeze it, they don't get any information. They won't give you credit. They won't give the guy who stole your identity credit either. And then the third idea I would do is when you file your tax return, or, or maybe not this year, but next year, you can request an IRS PIN number so that your PIN number protects your, your tax return from somebody else filing your return because I've got your social security number and I file a fraudulent return. Those three things protect your credit and protect your protect your wealth. And I, and I would seriously do those three steps. And then when you need credit, you're buying a car, you just unfreeze it for a week or a day or whatever you need, and it goes back on. And, really, and it doesn't cost you anything to do it. Those three things don't cost you a penny. I have never heard of any of those three tips before. So I'm like, yeah, these are these are wonderful. It makes a ton of sense that you would freeze it if you're not using it, exactly. clean up these cards. Um, if you close a card that the account is already closed, it doesn't affect your credit, right? Because well, there, there's some people who say that if you sell, if you close a credit account, it, it temporarily hurts your credit because you close it, which makes no sense to me. I mean, I, I, I don't understand how that works, but even if it does, I would rather have my credit score go down temporarily because I closed the credit card. And if that's what you're going to slap my hand with, great. But at the same point, I'd rather not have that credit account out there. I mean, listen, everybody can get down to their favorite travel credit card and their whatever their favorite department store credit card or whatever it is. You don't need 100 credit cards. I mean, you yeah. can live with two or three, a gas card, whatever it is, earn your miles, earn your hotel points, whatever it is. But, but get rid of the other ones because you're on a computer that is going to get hacked. And it's just when, and then they always send you, no, you might have been hacked. Well, were you the one hacked or were you not the one hacked? <laughs> you know, but if you're in that group, why were you there? And so the point of it is get out of the group before it gets hacked and, yeah. and live, live a simpler, simpler life. And then you can relax when somebody else gets hacked. You can enjoy your life and you can live your rent. You're going to keep going back to that. You know, yeah. you have control of it. It makes a ton of sense. I mean, yeah, and everything is getting hacked these days. It's getting worse and worse by the day. And um, yeah, I, I like all three of those tips. So I appreciate you throwing those in there um, for our audience today. Even some audience member goes, wow, Rob's a wealth of information. Such an expert. Who knew? Well, I appreciate it. I mean, there's just little <laughs> little stuff you can do. I mean, it's, and that's where the wealth, wealth plan comes into. If identifying what you're weak, fixing the things you can now, and maybe you have to strategize and say, okay, we'll fix the will in a year or we'll do this. But there's just little things you can just tighten up and, and you've, you've improved your odds of, of happiness and, and, and not being hacked a hundred times, a hundred times. Yeah. And they're all, those were all little pieces to do. And even some of the wealth plan, I mean, it's never like a big haul of life changes and different things. It's just a little bit here and a little bit there. And it's like exponential growth of security. Um, you know, for yourself and for your family. Absolutely. And then the, here's, here's a, I'll give you one more tidbit. Is if you're in a 401k or a 403b, you have to make two decisions. One is, say your bucket, say you have 100,000 in the 401k, set the risk to that to something more conservative, like 70, 30, 70% stocks, 30% bonds, whatever your personal risk profile, protect the bucket. But on your future contributions, only buy stock. Because if the stock market is crashing, you get to buy more shares every time you your payroll withhold and so th there's two decisions in a 401k but nobody ever makes them they all put it at the same thing and you're and there's no point to it protect your bucket and be aggressive going forward and then rebalance your bucket maybe once a year but there's two decisions there mm. yeah and a 401k is something that we usually you know fill out when we're starting this new job exactly. and we have everything else going on so it's like i didn't know what the options were much less you know, we just got it done because that's such a busy time. So it's definitely something we should always read, really look back at, especially, you know, if we've been at the job, got to really check out what's going on for sure. Right. Well, absolutely. And if, and if you're married and your husband has a different set of ad, uh, investment elections, look at them together and make the mm. best investment. If he maybe has a better international manager, so then you don't put any international managers in yours. Or maybe he's got a better real estate manager and you don't or vice versa. They don't have to be identical. Your wealth should be one big bucket and it's managed as a bucket. And that'll be a lot easier than to manage everything micromanaged. 
because you, you'll end up with duplicity and it won't make sense. And it's really the process of a wealth plan is to align all your assets in the same direction, kind of like tires on a wheel and get the mm -hmm. car going in the same direction. That's a very good analogy. I could just see it in my head. Um, well, this has been a ton of great information today, Rob. Um, I appreciate you coming on. Is there any last pieces of words or wisdom you'd like to share with the audience today? Well, I, th I think as a summary, you know, we pretty well have, have hit on it, but it's really accept what you don't know and then find the expertise to help you. I mean, as if, you know, and if you were sick, you go to a doctor. Well, you don't have to wait to be financially sick to go to a financial advisor. Find a fee-only fiduciary advisor. Get the knowledge so that you can make good decisions. Create a plan with goals, with timeframes, and give you direction. And the reason you want to do that is you want to enjoy your freedom and enjoy your time. And, and why do you want to do that? We're going to back to my favorite line. You deserve to relax, enjoy your life, and live your adventure. And if you can get those things straight, I'll guarantee you that last part will be the easiest thing you've ever done. And I think you'll thank yourself every day. Absolutely. We're all looking to relax. Um, Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you coming on today, Rob. Um, you guys can always reach out to Rob at Rob, Rob at Endowment wm.com um, it's there at the bottom of the screen um, he's also one of our purse strings approved professionals so you can check him out at our site purstrings.co um, and we appreciate everyone tuning in today on this monday thank you again rob appreciate it thanks Randy. all right we'll talk appreciate to everyone next week bye-bye bye-bye